Well, fantastic. I'm delighted to be here today. I'm delighted to see the turnout as we were changing venues this year. We never really know what to expect. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, we will try to increase room and space next year. Uh, uh, I hope that it was a convenient location for everyone. Lunch looked great as well. And, and really the staff, you know, uh, 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 put this whole thing together and, uh, and I really have to say, you know, I do almost nothing but ask them, what do we got planned? What do we got planned? And, and they really deserve all the credit for it. So we... Thank you. They, they, they deserve that. So our, our theme today, we had a, you know, we're always trying to think of a, a general theme. Of course, the big theme for the health fair is engagement. Get out, get your brain active, get your body active. Uh, we like all the exhibitors to put together interactive tables where there are things to do, not just picking up information. And then our general theme, and our theme this year is really communication, uh, uh, technology, and the like. And when we were thinking about communication, we thought, yes, communication between one another, communication using technology, but also communication with non-humans. Those are our animals. And so we'll review a little bit today of the science that is out there in regards to animal-human interaction. So everyone knows, you know, we love our pets, you know, we care for them, we give them everything that they need, right? Uh, we feed them, we pay the pet vet bills that are sometimes astronomical, I'm, I'm shocked, uh, clean up their bathroom accidents, things we frequently wouldn't do for another human being, e endure damage to our furniture, uh, uh, the chewed corner of the couch is always a dead give me that there's an animal in the house, uh, uh, and uh, leave fur and dander around everywhere. And we love this uh, uh, abuse. And we have to think about, really, what do those animals do to us, you know? Well, you know, they are a source of companionship for many, and that's fantastic. For, for many people, caring for an animal gives a sense of purpose, and that can be very, very important. Of course, love and affection. Uh, perhaps you have an attack kitty or, or something, but they may actually protect your home, bark when strangers come by. Uh, I know mine will, will bark at just about anybody and then lick them. Uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, but, you know, one has to ask, maybe our pets do even more. Maybe they give even more than that. And that's really the question. And the question, of course, as a doctor is, well, what do they do for our health? Uh, uh, do they help our immune systems? Do they help our cardiovascular or other uh, 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 health risk factors? Do they help our brains? And uh, I think that th these are all really, really interesting questions. So let's explore some of what is out there. A resistance to the development of food allergies. Isn't this fascinating? One always thinks, you know, well, you know, we can't have animals around little kids because they'll develop an allergy to dog or cat fur. Well, this is a fascinating study, and what they did here, uh, it, it's called the EATS study, and it's studying whether or not children go on to develop food allergies, right, like peanut allergies or soy allergies or wheat allergies, and what they did was they analyzed the children on the basis of whether or not they were exposed to an animal in their own home for the first three months of their life. And what they found was, no, that the children exposed that early in life to animals absolutely did not develop allergies to cat or dog dander, uh, uh, to the, the, the fur or other uh, 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 issues there, but also they had a dramatically reduced food allergy uh, a profile. So growing up, in those first few months with a dog may actually boost the immune system and prevent allergies that might plague others throughout their entire lives. I found this just absolutely fascinating. 
So now our, our previous speakers, Suzanne, talked about natural disasters. And isn't that interesting, you know, that this has actually been studied. And this is a study that was done after the Japanese earthquake, devastating earthquake. And they looked at how people adapted to the natural disaster, whether on, on the basis of whether or not they had a pet that they cared for. Now, the bad news is, is that in the midst of that natural disaster, that earthquake, people that had a pet were more stressed out than the people that didn't have a pet because they were worried about their pets. They followed these folks, though, over the years. And at four years after that earthquake, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, was actually quite common in the survivors uh, of that uh, earthquake. Uh, and what they found was that having a pet almost completely prevented the development of PTSD after that natural disaster. So somehow that relationship, that immediate response, even though negative and it was more stressful during the earthquake, afterwards allowed a healing process to occur. It's really uh, uh, absolutely amazing. How about cardiovascular risk? So this is a, a, a very large study that was done. Uh, it's what we call a meta-analysis, where we looked at bunches of different scientific studies that have looked at whether or not you're going to have a heart attack or a stroke, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular disease, on the basis of whether you have a pet or not. And the way that this works uh, uh, in the graph is a one, the, a score of one, which is that kind of dark line up the middle, that score of one means having a pet neither helps nor does it harm. And what we saw across the board uh, in this study is that having a pet is associated with actually a lower risk of heart attack or stroke. Benefits marginal. It looked like dogs were perhaps uh, 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 a little more favored uh, in that over cats, but hard to tell uh, in that study in general. But then really, this is amazing, you know, and one has to scratch their head and say, well, why in the world would that be the case? may have to do with other aspects of care. So we know that physical and social health and activity is influenced by whether or not one has a pet. And so one could say, well, I have a pet, you know, that's my companion, so I don't have to go out and engage socially with others. I, uh, I have a pet, we're going to sit in the house and we're not going to do anything, we're not going to go to the gym or the Y because I can't leave my pet alone. But it turns out that the exact opposite is true. So this is a study that looked at physical function and health-related uh, abilities, and then social functions. How much you get out of the home and interact with those in your neighborhood, with those in other areas, and across the board when it came to physical functioning and social engagement, having a pet is great for you. And it doesn't make you pet-centric. What it does is it engages you. Pets are often a bridge to others and they keep us moving, that's for sure. So one can ask about brain health. Of course, that's my bailiwick and, and what I do for a living. So one could say, well, what about pets and risk for Alzheimer's disease? Does having a pet increase your risk, decrease your risk? Does it do nothing? So it's a fascinating, you know, in putting this together. Uh, I, I looked online at what we call PubMed, the National Library Database of Scientific Medical Articles, and tried to pull up pets and dementia. And when you pull that up and then weed through those, there are only nine papers in the history of humankind. There are only nine studies. Uh, that have actually looked at pets and behavior. On the other hand, on the right-hand side of the screen, you see what we call a PET scan. It has nothing to do with dogs or cats or anything else. This is a, this is a scan that looks at the function of the brain. 
And uh, we've only been using PET scans really for about 15 years in the field of Alzheimer's. We've already got 3,308 publications uh, uh, out there over that 10 year period. That's almost three, uh, 15 year period. It's almost uh, uh, 250 a year, almost one for every working day of the year. Some scientists and doctors actually get the weekends off. So, uh, 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 just amazing. And it makes me scratch my head and think, well, maybe this really should be studied. Maybe this really is important. Uh, uh, and we should understand this when we're trying to modify our own risk for diseases like Alzheimer's. So let's take a look at what's published out there, and I have a few tidbits here. This is a, 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 a just a, what I find a fascinating study. It is aquariums. Can you believe it? Pet fish. So uh, here's a study. So they're in a dementia care facility, and one of the biggest problems that we have with folks as their Alzheimer's or other form of dementia progresses is they lose interest in food. They stop eating and uh, they lose weight. And we know that this is a precursor to the eventual end and, and a reduced quality of life. So what they did was they took these nursing facilities and for two weeks, they measured everybody's weight every day and calorie counted how much each of the residents were eating each day. And then at the start of week three, they put aquariums. This was done in about nine different dementia care facilities, same benefit across all of them. All they did was put an aquarium in the dining room. One can see over here on the slide, this is baseline how much they were intaking for food. Weeks three to four, they already almost doubled their nutritional intake. Nothing changed. There's an aquarium in the room. By weeks five and 10, they almost quadrupled. They were eating four times more. And this was reflected in a slow and steady increase in weight across those patients. So isn't that fascinating? Maybe they don't have to be furry. Maybe you don't have to pet them. I don't know, maybe people pet their goldfish out there. Uh, I, I, usually those fish are too quick for me. But, uh, 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 but I found that fascinating. So another study that's been done is, and it, this really addresses one of the questions that was asked earlier, does bringing a dog or a pet into an Alzheimer patient actually have an impact on their disease? So again, same type of study. This is a, a dementia. This study was done in a dementia care facility. Uh, so all the folks with Alzheimer's disease of, of at least moderate stage. And, excuse me. And many times we know that as one develops a disease like Alzheimer's disease, anxiety can kind of increase and, and depression can become a major problem. And so what they did was they randomized people in the dementia care facility to receive pet therapy. So over 10 weeks. So what they did was just once a week for an hour, they brought in a therapy dog to hang out with an Alzheimer patient. And the placebo group did not get a therapy dog. They just went about their daily activities. And then they measured anxiety, what we call the CMAI, the Cohen-Mansfield Anxiety Index, and the DMAS, the Dementia Mood Assessment Scale, uh, which measures depression. And they measured it in the group. And what they found was that people randomized to not have pet therapy continued to show increases in both anxiety and depression over the study period. But for those that received just one hour of being with a dog or a cat once a week, actually either stabilized in terms of their other symptoms or in terms of depression actually improved and got better, lowered their, their depression scores. So this is fascinating uh, uh, as well. 
But what I really am also interested in is not just can we use pets to help people that are already in dementia care facilities, what do pets do for us, right? So we're all out there living our day in, day out lives. You all are, are coming here today, you know, to the health fair to engage. Each one of us, each one of you, has a future risk for Alzheimer's disease. And we always want to know, what can I do to reduce that risk? The answer could be found nowhere in the literature. And so several years ago, you know, we always like this, and the question actually came up from one of our research participants who said, what do you know about pets and prevention of Alzheimer's disease? Does this uh, uh, work or not? We looked at that time, there was no data whatsoever, and so we studied it. So some of you that are in our research program may actually be part of this research study. We haven't published it yet. I need to publish it. The paper is written. I just haven't sent it in and finalized it yet, but absolutely fascinating. So this is what the data shows. And, and so what we have here is what's called the MMSE on the y-axis up and down. This is a memory and thinking test. And then what we have on the x-axis is pet intimacy. So not do you own a pet or not, but if you don't own a pet, but your neighbor owns a pet, and you frequently pet that pet and care for that pet, then you get a score. You get a score for all of the different ways that you might interact with a pet. So this doesn't work if you just have a dog in the house that you ignore. Right, or, or a cat that never visits with you, you know, and uh, 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 hides under the couch. Uh, uh, this is actually human-pet interactions at, at, a, at an intimate level. And these are folks with mild memory problems, what we call mild cognitive impairment. So we see those who uh, 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 have pets in red. So people who have pets and have high levels of intimacy actually improve their memory and thinking test scores. People that don't have pets actually show a decline in their memory and thinking over time. Now granted, these are already people with mild cognitive impairment or early dementia. What about those that are completely normal? And so the good news here is if you do not have a pet, it doesn't matter. This yellow line is essentially flat. It's not going to change your memory and thinking test score. But if you have a pet, boom, you're going to shoot up a few points on your memory and thinking testing. Presumably, presumably, and it's a hypothesis, that you're more physically active, you're more socially engaged, and there's something about that intimate relationship with the animals that is actually beneficial for humans. Dogs may be a person's best friend. So you don't have to own a pet to get these benefits. But on your way out today, stop and pet Callie. Knock a few plaques out of your brain. Protect yourself against Alzheimer's disease. The dogs are delightful. <laughs>